Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I think we're going to get started here. Looks like our participants are filing in. Um, this webinar is about steam trap monitoring using batteryless sensors. So our agenda for today, uh, we're going to do some introductions. I'm going to talk a little bit about our company, and we're going to take a deep dive into our steam trap monitor, kind of how it works, uh, what sets us apart from the competition when it comes to steam reliability in your environment, and then talk a little bit about what next steps look like if you wanted to get uh, this set up for you. So first things first, my name is Peter Woodman. I'm a sales engineer here at EverActive. I've been here with the company since before we launched our, our first product. So it's been fun to see this technology, really cutting edge technology come from kind of the R&D research pre-release and then get out into customer environments where we have thousands of sensors now in the world gathering data, uh, reporting on the states of all kinds of different industrial assets. So there's a picture of me in happier times on a customer site. Uh, today I'm coming to you from a conference room in one of our offices in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So um, hopefully we'll be back out there in the field working with our customers again shortly. Okay, so uh, ever active introduction here. Uh, Internet of Things, the IoT has not lived up to the hype. If you look at this chart here, you can see back in 2012, the team at IBM Watson said, hey, three years from 2012, in 2015, there'd be a trillion Internet of Things devices out there in the world. By the time we got to 2015, that was not the case. Uh, the numbers were much lower. And you can see these expectations keep getting adjusted and the numbers get lower every single time. And it's not because people don't want this data. They desperately want to connect these older assets or parts of their plant to the Internet of Things. So they have constant access to that data. Uh, but there are some limitations. So as we get to today, uh, we, we're not even in the billions for Internet of Things attached devices, certainly not in industrial environments. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why we think that is. The first is batteries. Batteries have put an artificially low ceiling on the Internet of Things. Um, for starters, you know, batteries require you to go back to these things and visit them uh, upon expiration. And a, a lot of our customers, the whole reason why they're censoring something up is they don't have to make a trip back to it. I think that hits home you know, this week, this month in particular, uh, where we physically can't get to all these things we want to monitor or check on. Even running PDM routes, unless it's something that's critical or essential, you know, you guys may have pushed those off due to staff shortages or the inability to travel uh, to places where you'd like to sense things. So, so at any rate, uh, uh, batteries, uh, logistically, we've visited a lot of customer environments now. I have yet to meet a maintenance team that's focused on batteries. I have yet to meet somebody with the title battery changer uh, in one of these plants. But there are a lot of batteries out there, and uh, it requires a lot of planning if you wanted to grow that. As a result, we see our customers uh, just not adopting as many sensors as they should. Even if you had tremendous battery life, a 10-year battery life, which we rarely see a battery that lasts that long. If we got to that trillion number that the IBM Watson team had talked about, we'd still be doing 274 million replacements per day. Uh, not to mention uh, the environmental impacts of batteries. Um, some are able to be recycled, but even if they're able to be recycled, that doesn't mean everyone's doing it. I know at home I have a jar full of dead batteries. Uh, and there's no direct place I can take them where I'm at. So we have to kind of store them up into a, a big container and then once a year or so get them off to somewhere. I think a lot of our, our uh, potential customers have to throw them away because they can't warehouse them for long periods of time. So, so what's wrong with batteries? Obviously, everybody wants all the things you'd get out of an IoT solution. Uh, the predictive maintenance stuff in particular, right, condition-based monitoring, trying to figure out, you know, when an asset could fail, uh, being able to monitor that, that, that's something that could be invaluable, right? Uh, that's something everybody's after. But it's, it's difficult uh, if you're going to subscribe to a lifetime of battery replacements for all these things uh, because it adds cost. So as a result, we see the scales a lot lower on what people are willing to put out there. They want thousands of points of data. They settle for a couple dozen you know, or fewer. You know, they look at only the most critical things instead of blanketing their facility with these sensors. Uh, and then the sensors themselves have to ration how many times a day they transmit in order to make that battery last as long as possible. So instead of getting continuous insights, you're getting, you know, maybe a couple an hour or sometimes a couple a day. Uh, speaking about, you know, the, that fictional battery team I thought of, uh, if you wanted to have, you know, a million points of data coming through your plant, which is not unreasonable if you think about all the points in process where you need that data, if you try to do that off the back of battery-powered sensors alone, it could take 120 full-time employees. 
out there changing all those batteries. Uh, it's just not happening in our customer environment. So the, uh, the second reason why we aren't seeing adoption at scale for IoT, why we're not seeing that trillion sensor number out there, is the fragmentation of what's on the market today. There are people who will sell you a sensor, uh, but you know uh, nothing to do with the output of that. So you have a, a one component sensor, you become a systems integrator trying to get the sensor to report to some type of IoT gateway. Where does the IoT gateway data go? How do you access it from the cloud? How do you interpret it? You know. Uh, some big companies have teams and teams of data scientists who can sit down and look at that, but uh, usually you're not you know, at the plant level seeing people who can immediately interpret this data just by looking at it. Uh, so that's, you know, just added all these layers. We talked to someone who was taking on a steam trap monitoring project when we were uh, releasing our product, and the competitor had four different vendors come to the meeting just to tackle this problem of steam trap monitoring, one for each of the columns or rows you see here. And uh, so that's another thing, just turning a, you know, the innovation department or an operational tech in a plant into a systems integrator makes it really difficult to bring these things on. Uh, so we've seen lesser adoption as a result. Okay, so that's our problem definition. Let's talk a little bit about EverActive now. Uh, EverActive is a company that was founded with the idea that instead of, uh, if we were able to make these sensors that people today are seeing as uh, you know, something that's highly short prized, few assets in an environment where you can only roll out one or two. And if you could take away that maintenance problem, take away that battery problem, you could put out many, many more sensors into the environment. We call these Ever sensors. Uh, they use a low power radio communication standard we call Evernet with tremendous range uh, to go from those endpoint assets up to a traditional IoT gateway. From the IoT gateway, it looks like a very standard IT transaction. Uh, packets of data then move using cellular LTE or plant-wide Wi-Fi if you have it, or Ethernet. Typically, we use LTE. That's the easiest way to get started because it's not dependent upon your IT department or existing infrastructure. From there, the data flows up to the cloud. Uh, and in the cloud, you can take a look at it for yourself, but we also run analytics on our cloud platform that can send you a notification saying it's time to take action on this failing asset. So that's our solution from bottom to top. Everything you see here is included in our, our monitoring fee, our subscription fee. Uh, so from the sensors, the chips in the individual sensors, all the way up to the cloud web UI and, and the transmission to get it there is provided by us and maintained by our employees. Uh, for you, this means uh, out from those endpoints, we apply these sensors. They are continuously sensing and transmitting back wirelessly. They use harvested energy to do that. That's why we say they're batteryless. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Uh, they're designed to go into industrial environments. So they're IP66, which is a classification that means they're protected against fluids, water, dust, uh, in, ingress into the enclosure. Uh, they're class one, div two for intrinsic safety. So if you have environments where there's a risk of explosion, we're explosion proof at that certification level. And you know, when I say wide operating range, we've designed these things to be indoor, outdoor, in harsh process facilities. We have customers in food production, oil and gas, Areas where there's caustic cleaning, even uh, they've survived acid wash. So this isn't like you know a scientific thermometer we pulled off the shelf, you know, prosumer hardware that we tried to make fit in your environment. It's been designed from the bottom up to go into areas where you know you see steam systems indoors and outdoors. So from there, the sensors transmit continuously. The reason why we say new data streams is, you know, a lot of people haven't gathered data like this before at this scale. If you're checking your steam traps once a quarter or once a year, uh, our sensor is transmitting, you know, measuring continuously and transmitting once a minute. Uh, in the first hour, you'll get more data points about your steam system than you've had for years uh, under the traditional methods. So those new data streams, we warehouse those, you know, on our cloud platform, and when there's uh, information there, evidence that action needs to be taken, we send you a notification. Typically that's an email, but it could also be a text message. Uh, we're integrating into some customer work order systems, so we could file a work order uh, with you, and that allows you to know when it's time to go out and, and take action. So instead of running routes, checking traps that are 80% of the time good, uh, you know, save those eight out of uh, 10 trips and just go to the 20% of your traps that need attention. Uh, all without ever changing a battery. So batteryless. Uh, our core technology was spun out of university research. Our co-founders are university professors that met at MIT. They went back to their home universities, 
one at the University of Michigan, the other at the University of Virginia, where they opened labs for research. Uh, one of them focused on making the lowest power radios in the world, and the other on super low power computing. When you bring those two things together, you get sensors that can operate continuously off of energy that's already there. And when I say that, in the case of the steam trap monitor, we use a thermoelectric generator. We know we're going to have a hot pipe, so we apply this thermoelectric generator that takes the waste heat emanating off that pipe and turns it into electrical current. We'll take a look at what that actually looks like here. I have one in the room with me. Um, but just know that as a company, we're bringing a family of sensors to industry that all run off of harvested energy. There's uh, multiple different sources we can use for that. Temperature differential is always going to be plentiful in a steam system. So uh, we lead with that uh, when it comes to steam trap monitoring. In other applications, we can use solar. Uh, RF and vibration can also be harvested to power sensors. So lots of different options there uh, for different applications. Knowing steam systems are often in dark areas. We're not really using solar there as much, but we know we're going to have a hot pipe. So that's why we use a thermoelectric generator. This means for uh, a potential customer is that our solution is going to work right out of the box. Uh, you can pick it up and get going. We've installed hundreds of sensors in a day. Uh, and the time from taking a sensor out of the box to applying it to a trap and seeing real-time data flowing to the cloud is minutes, uh, usually under five minutes from the time you take the sensor out of the box, put it on the trap, and you're up and going. We help with that as well. All right, you know, in a typical installation, we're working with our customers to get these out there. Uh, you know, we're a, a monitoring service at the end of the day, so we want to make sure you're running continuously. Um, since there's no battery uh, on these sensors, there's no added maintenance by putting our solution in. You apply these sensors once, you only go back to that steam trap when you know there's something wrong with it. So you're, you're not going back uh, because your battery is down to 10% and you don't want it to die off. We also have a calculator on our platform that helps us determine how much money you're saving by applying our ever-active sensors to your steam traps. So when we say maximized returns, there's a very clear return on investment we can help you make the case for. I'll show some examples of that later in the presentation, but just know that the reason why we chose such a specific application to get started with is we wanted to make sure we could demonstrate return on investment for you uh, and the, the people in your organization who are going to insist on that before you set out on a new project like installing cutting edge sensors. So we provide that, uh, that through hardware. You know, we're a monitoring service that's powered by this unique hardware that we've developed. Um, sensors and gateways there shown on the left, uh, usually dozens to hundreds of steam traps reporting to a single gateway, uh, and then those go up to the cloud from there where you can access it from anywhere. This slide says cross-platform software, but it's really universal. Once we've installed our sensors and the network is backhauling that data, you can access it from a phone, a tablet, a PC, a Mac, really anything that has a web browser on it. You don't have to install software onto your machine. We give you a login, you navigate to the cloud portal, and it's as simple as logging into you know, Facebook or any other website that you'd log into, any of your Google apps. And from there, you can see real-time data in a time series, uh, either as a spreadsheet or in a graph. Um, but we're going to hint you ahead of time. We're going to send you a, an email or a text message if there's something wrong with a link to that asset so you can see the moment when it changed uh, and understand why we came to that determination. So. Okay, so that's our the overview of the company in general. I'm going to talk a little bit about the steam trap monitor itself now, how we get there. Why would we start with steam traps, you ask? Uh, the Department of Energy says that the failure rate on steam traps annually is about 20%. So over the course of a year, you know, you're expected to lose about 20% of your fleet to failure in some way or another. Uh, a friend of mine who works at a steam trap manufacturer said that they're designed to fail, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the point. They are designed to fail uh, to work as they're supposed to. There are going to be elements in them that need to be replaced over time. Uh, some global numbers here, big shock and awe numbers. Globally, we see $53 billion in wasted energy annually and uh, you know, hundreds of millions of tons of wasted CO2. If your organization is incentivized to conserve waste energy, whether it's wasted steam, wasted gas to produce that steam or coal to produce that steam, uh, or just wasted CO2 emissions, there's a pretty clear path from installing these sensors to figuring out how much energy has been wasted and how much you're saving. There's also another category here that we help address, and that's the risk of a process being interrupted. You know, if a steam trap is plugged, it's not going to waste steam per se, but water could begin to back up and fill the system. 
and that could flood a piece of equipment that could be damaged irreparably. Uh, that could have a very expensive cost to it. Uh, we have a, a customer that makes pharmaceuticals and they had problems with steam traps failing that caused uh, the, their sterilized in place equipment, they have clean in place equipment where they use steam. They're regulated by the FDA, so it has to reach a certain temperature. They had a steam reliability issue around failed traps that caused them to not hit that temperature for the mandated amount of time where they need to be up there to be sterilized. Uh, they determined this after they'd already put ingredients in for a batch of pharmaceuticals, so they had to throw out the whole batch. Uh, the opportunity cost of that wasted batch of pharmaceuticals was a million dollar problem. So when you think about you know, the costs of your process going down, uh, in some manufacturing sites, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars per hour, and you may need to turn steam off to part of your process in order to make that repair. You know, emergency costs are always more expensive than if you can do them in a, a way that's more planned and regimented. Uh, so knowing that you have a trap down on a process where multiple traps could cause you to lose, uh, you lose your process production could be invaluable. There's also a risk of EHS incidents with steam. We've seen steam reliability issues lead to things like water hammer uh, and explosions. Um, we've seen plug traps where water backed up, froze, and expanded, and damaged equipment through you know, the expansion of ice. Uh, so these are all different ways where uh, you can see if you're not on top of your steam reliability, uh, you can see problems just above and beyond wasted energy. So uh, how are people dealing with this today before the invent of you know, wireless battery-less sensors. Typically, our customers were doing manual audits. That requires a human to get up out of their chair, grab an, uh, an ultrasound gun or an IR gun and, and do laps around the facility and check on these traps. As a result, they're not doing them every day. Uh, one of our research partners here at the University of Michigan, they have 13,000 steam traps on campus. They can't even get to all of them every year. So some of those steam traps are on a three-year replacement cycle. Uh, some are in HVAC applications for comfort heat, reheat, domestic hot water, that kind of thing. Some of them are used for sterilization of autoclaves in the medical center here. Uh, so trying to pick and choose which ones are most important to check on. Uh, as a result, you're just not getting to all of them every year. When you are getting to them, you're getting a small sample size. You know, you have somebody going out with one of these measuring devices, listening to the trap for two or three minutes out of an entire year. Uh, we've seen trap behaviors where a trap could look like it's failed and sound like it's failed over ultrasound for a couple of minutes out of a day or a couple of minutes out of a month and then return to normal behavior. Uh, so it may not be worth going to replace that trap if it's only in that failure state and recovering from it. Uh, likewise, we've seen traps that are failed most of the time but have short recoveries due to changes in process. So as a result, you're not getting a complete picture. Uh, those false readings mean you're replacing a trap and, and maybe it's not you know, ultimately fixing the problem. If you have a problem with the plumbing in the system and you replace the trap, it could fall into the same behavior as the trap you just replaced. Uh, and the only way to know for sure if that trap is operating correctly is through continuous monitoring, not just a little snapshot for a couple minutes out of the year. So you might say, hey, maybe a battery powered sensor could, could give you enough insight to get away with this. That certainly would report more often than a manual inspection. But most of the battery powered sensors we have have steep costs. Up front, you're paying for the instrumentation, which is usually expensive, you know, low four figures to get started. Uh, and then the batteries themselves have a replacement cost and time. So a human is still getting up out of a chair and going to visit that trap before it's time to service the trap because they're swapping out the battery. Uh, we've seen batteries for uh, solutions that look like ours on the battery powered side. One of them was a $300 battery that lasts about three years. So now you're paying a $100 per year average battery cost to keep that sensor powered. So it's not like the, the battery powered sensors are maintenance free. As a result, I think it's really difficult to scale. People do not want to you know, be in the business of keeping hundreds to thousands of batteries on their shelves. Uh, and a lot of these protocols are not designed to have hundreds of things like steam traps reporting continuously on them. So. Uh, in wireless heart or even Wi-Fi, right? Think, you think about Wi-Fi as something that's pretty dense, but once you get a couple hundred devices on a single Wi-Fi access point, it's going to drop off and stop taking new connections. So through all these limitations, uh, as a result, we see about 95% of our customers are sticking with manual audits, uh, and they're just accepting that there's a waste in between them uh, that they're going to have to deal with. Here's our steam trap monitor. And I have one here I'll show you in a moment, um, but 
From a batteryless standpoint, this is our power source. It's a thermoelectric generator. There's heat fins on one side to dissipate heat and a saddle on the other side that mates to the pipe. Everything you see here is toolless. So our thermistors that measure the traps temperature on the inlet and outlet side uh, clip on quickly. We have these pressure fit clips here in environments that call for stainless. You can use stainless steel band clamps as well. Uh, we know we have a hot pipe on the steam supply side of a trap. So it doesn't take a much temperature differential to power up our sensor. A steam pipe is always going to be more than we need. Uh, it's you know something on the order of two to three degrees Celsius we need to start communicating uh, on our sensor side. And here's the sensor pack itself. So in this application, you can see it's zip tied to an insulated stretch of pipe. Uh, the sensor pack itself is plastic, so we put that somewhere where it's not going to be exposed to the hot pipe. Uh, but this is the brains of the operation here. So this ever sensor. Uh, transmits continuously back to our IoT gateway. Uh, it receives wake-ups from there, uh, but once a minute it's going to broadcast back to that what the state of the trap is. Uh, it's powered by a thermoelectric generator, so there's no batteries involved in it. As a result, it has a 20-year life. You install it on that trap, the electronics bios are rated to last 20 years. Something were to happen you know, prematurely and the sensor failed before that, as a part of your monitoring service, we'd send you a new one to put on the trap. Uh, but we're, we've done accelerated life testing and put these in some very harsh environments in pre-release, and they're surviving well out in, in the field. So you attach this sensor to the pipe using zip ties or a Velcro strap. Uh, the face of it points towards the gateway, and that handles the communication. Here's a close-up of that thermoelectric generator. So in the center of this is something called a Peltier device. It's two pieces of uh, metals, different metals. Those dissimilar metals, if one is warmer than the other, will start generating uh, just a trace amount of electrical current. For example, if you take like an Apple Watch, which is a pretty power efficient small device with a small battery, uh, there's not enough energy generated by a tag in order to boot it up. Uh, and that's because the Apple Watch has LTE, Wi-Fi, a screen, and Bluetooth low energy. Our sensors aren't dependent upon any of those things. So uh, in the case of Bluetooth low energy, which is considered a very, very power efficient uh, protocol, uh, our radio, our, our wake up radio on the steam trap monitor is about a thousand times lower in its energy consumption than a Bluetooth low energy radio. So as a result, that always on radio uh, can run off of this very humble harvested energy budget from a small thermoelectric generator or a small solar cell. If you think about some of the battery powered sensors that are out there today using really power hungry radio protocols, in order to pull this off with a thermoelectric generator, you need one huge, like you know, the size of a basketball or larger in order to, to fit. And you just are not gonna see that much pipe uh, around a steam trap in, in our customer environments. So we've made these to, uh, to fit all different kinds of plumbing. Uh, the kit I'm gonna show you today is for sub one inch pipes, but we go up much larger than that, you know, the three and four inch pipe. So uh, just keep in mind that we have all different kinds of applications. We pride ourselves on retrofitting to pretty much any steam trap you can find, and we're out on a huge distribution, hundreds of different types of steam traps out there in the world today. So it's a difference in temperature that powers this ultimately. That's why we have a heat sink on the end. Uh, the difference between that hot pipe and the air temperature is what actually generates the current in that Peltier device. So we apply these uh, and leave those fins of the heat sink exposed to air. You can insulate over the thermistors, uh, but we don't insulate over this thermoelectric generator. The thermistors themselves, we put as close to the trap as we can. They're really small, smaller than an inch, so they usually fit in the unions around the trap itself without having to make you know, any modifications to the system. Um, our system trains on the steam traps, each individual trap it's installed on. So if you have to move this thermistor downstream from the trap a little bit, uh, we can take that into account in our algorithm when we're learning on the behavior of the trap. And a complete install here, another picture of that. We have our thermoelectric generator up top, an inlet thermistor on this trap, an outlet thermistor, and then that sensor itself that handles the transmission. You'll notice here that this trap has a tag on it. You know, this particular customer already had a system in place to tag their traps, and we can take that into account when we set up the system. So we can take your trap tags and other metadata, like what room, what location in the room, what building uh, that steam trap's installed in. So when you get a notification, to go and change that trap, you can you know, cut right to that and not have to wonder, all right, which one of these has failed? Each sensor has unique identifiers on it. Uh, it's got a unique radio MAC address. That's like the fingerprint of the radio so we can tell them apart. 
Uh, so you'll know exactly which trap needs to go and be serviced when you get that notification. From there, you can see in our software, you know, we have pretty simple to use software that can show you exactly how the trap's behaving. We'll call attention to the ones that need servicing, but at any time you could dive in and look at good or bad traps and compare them to one another. Uh, each trap behaves a little bit differently. That's why we use a, an algorithm and we have you know, a learning method for our traps. When we first started developing this product, uh, we were hopeful that it would be very simple to determine if a trap was failed or not, like a simple threshold. If the temp goes above X or below Y, we know it's a failure. That's actually not the case. Each steam trap behaves a little bit differently. There's no global rules for them. Even if you took the same make and model of steam trap in a similar application, there could be some variance in how it uh, behaves, depending on what's around it, what it's in service of, what the length of the plumbing is between there, whether the plumbing's insulated or not. So we take all of that into account when we learn each of these traps, and, uh, and that allows us to, to account for it. Here's an example trap, pretty clear in, in the case of this one, uh, before when it was failed and, and blowing, you can see that the steam and condensate temperatures are really close to one another. This is a screenshot of an actual customer trap from our web interface. Uh, they turned off steam here to perform the repair, and then after performing that repair, you can see the temperatures just that, that difference between the condensate temperature, it dropped about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the, an example there. If you convert that to therms or BTUs of heat, you can see how much energy is being saved uh, as we stop that steam from just flowing through that blow through trap. Uh, steam is where we started. And uh, as a result, you know, we're focused on that today. We can show you a little more about that. That's how we got hooked up with the wear folks because they're the steam experts. Uh, but there are other sensors we're bringing to market too. Uh, we try to think about applications first. We want to make sure that we're developing technology that's going to be valuable to our customers more than anything. So when we started looking at the steam trap problem, we started there and said, all right, what sensors are needed to determine a trap's operational state? In the case of the steam trap monitor, uh, we're using ambient temperature, remote temperatures, two of them, either side of the trap. Uh, we're also uh, gathering inside that ever sensor enclosure relative humidity and lux. Uh, so that's the sensing modalities we're using. And here are our energy sources that we can harvest from. In the case of a steam trap monitor, thermoelectric, that temperature differential is always going to be plentiful. So to make a steam trap monitor, we use these top four sensors and this harvester. Our second product that we're bringing to market uh, is a machine health monitor for pumps, fans, rotating and vibrating equipment. Uh, in the case of that product, it's taking temperature measurements. The humidity and locks are there as well in the uh, ambient. I should say lux is a, a measure of light, the presence of light. Uh, the machine health monitor also has an accelerometer and a magnetometer on it, so it's these top six sensing modalities. Uh, and it can be powered by either photovoltaic solar uh, or thermoelectric, a temperature difference. And it, it typically just powers off the skin temperature of the motor. And it only requires a little bit. If you were to put your hand on something like that motor and it were warm to the touch, that would be enough to power it. So a little bit of, of a peek ahead there. But if you think about these different sensing modalities and a few others that we've worked on in the lab that we haven't put into products yet, and then think about these harvester sources of energy, start to pick a few from column A and column B. You can see where we're going uh, later in 2020 and into 2021. So uh, one thing about our gateways, uh, we've designed this radio protocol, really that Evernet is, is one of our key pieces of intellectual property. So you start today with steam traps, they report to the Evercloud. Uh, that single dashboard can accommodate machine health and future products as well. Uh, and our gateways are, are you know, future-proofed as well. So they can uh, talk to your steam trap monitors today. As new products come to the market, they'll be able to reach them with that same uh, great range and uh, harvested energy budget. So once we blanket your facility in Evernet, it'll be easy to try out future products by applying just a handful of them once the communications are already in place, or to deploy them really rapidly uh, by just sticking them onto the assets and going. So we'll see an installation here at a steam trap monitor. I'll, I'll go through that quickly with you. Uh, but all of our products were aiming for a five minute install time or less. Uh, as you can see from our thermistors and thermoelectric generator, they mate to the outside of the pipe without penetrating the pipe which means you don't have to turn steam off to install them. You just have to make sure you're wearing thick gloves. So as I can tell you from experience. So as future products come to the market, uh, those will easily be able to report to the same gateways that, that you install for steam today. 
I'm going to dip out of the slide deck here for a moment, switch on the camera, and we're going to take a quick look at a steam trap monitor here uh, in our environment. The camera's on me. Let's switch that over. Okay. So we have a floating thermostat trap here. Uh, one thing I want to talk about first, uh, and that's a similar version of this same float trap. Um, we talk about a couple ways to determine payback on this solution. We start by figuring out what your cost of steam is. Uh, we take that cost of steam, the pressure that each individual trap's running at, and calculate something called the orifice diameter of the trap. In this case, this trap, when you open it up, uh, there's a float. And this float, basically as water fills the body of this steam trap, the float rises and falls. Uh, when the float's open, if it can't seat for some reason, that orifice diameter is how much steam will blow through, basically the, the measurement of how much steam will blow through when the trap is stuck open. So as these seals get gummed up, uh, the trap becomes unable to close, and then you see steam purging through there. It's a simple example of a float failure on a trap, uh, but know that we take note of that metadata around the trap so we can calculate what that orifice diameter is, uh, and that will allow us to determine what you're actually losing when a trap is stuck open. So here's an example of a trap with some plumbing around it, so you can see it more kind of in situ. Uh, we have our thermoelectric generator here. It just goes on pretty simply with thumb screws. Uh, we have saddles of different sizes to mate to different sizes of pipe. So uh, when you take this out of the box, it's a one inch kit by default, but we can use these reducers to fit a three quarter inch trap, a uh, half inch trap. If you leave it bare, it'll fit a one inch pipe. So, that's a snug fit for a three-quarter inch trap. We know it's the right one. While I have this thermoelectric generator off, I wanted to show you here, in between these blue fins, this top, this is for heat dissipation, and this is for heat transfer. But in the middle, there's a little something that looks like a Scrabble tile. That's that Peltier device that actually generates the uh, energy. And it does that anytime there's a, a difference between these two. So we're just using this mechanical engineering to exaggerate the difference, uh, transfer more heat this way and dissipate more of it that way. So these sensors ship with a one meter harness by default, but we can put extension harnesses on them if you need longer distances for some reason. Uh, we put the thermoelectric generator typically on the steam supply side of the trap, the hot side, but they could actually go anywhere in the steam system where you see a temperature differential. Some of our customers have them on the condensate side because there isn't enough room in the plumbing, uh, et cetera. Now the thermistor placement is pretty specific. You can see this one is tagged red. This thermistor has a red tag on it. So this is the one that goes on the steam supply side of the trap. And actually, if you hold these thermistors in your hand, I'm not sure if that's coming through on the video, but one side is rounded to mate to the pipe. So you just press this pressure fit clip over the top. And as I said, we can also use uh, stainless steel band clamps if you're in a production environment that doesn't permit you to use these copper clips. Uh, condensate side, same thing. We have a blue lead rounded thermistor that meets to the pipe. Press that over the top. Uh, we connect our sensor here. Uh, it's a pressure fit. You just push it on. No, uh, you know, it's not a rotational. You just push it in. That's watertight. Uh, zip tie this or Velcro it nearby, uh, and you'll see it start waking up within usually about 60 seconds. So if you have a, a temperature differential. So we've just gone through a steam trap monitor install pretty quick. Even with me talking and showing off all the parts, I think it was a couple of minutes tops. All right. Back to our slide deck here. Okay, so next steps. Let's think about what the costs of this actually are and uh, how we could save you money. That's one thing we haven't talked about yet. So in the case of this trap, this is a fairly small trap. That's a half inch line that's passing through it. So you could hold this trap in one hand easily. Um, that orifice we talked about, that interior part of the trap, the narrowest point where steam would flow freely if the trap was failed is 5 16ths of an inch on this trap. Uh, this particular one was running at 150 PSI, and our customer told us that they were paying about $10 for 1,000 pounds of steam. Uh, so if this trap were stuck open, it's a pretty simple equation to figure out. It's just under $20,000 a year in waste steam. 
pretty expensive problem. This is a medium bucket trap, so uh, inverted bucket they call it. Inside there, there's a, a kind of a float that sits inside the bottom of this. Uh, as water fills, it rises, steam pushes out the condensate, and it closes again. So this one's used in chiller reheat. Uh, in this particular application at the University of Michigan, um, this trap is used to make sure that comfort air isn't too cold coming off of a chiller. So they run steam year-round there. Uh, many places do for this type of thing. You know, you chill air down to get the water out of it, essentially, if you're going to use it in an air conditioning system. But in order to do that, you chill it down to about 55 degrees. You can't put 55 degree air back through a register. It'll shock the person that's on the other end of it. So even on the hottest day of the year, they're still producing steam to heat this air back up to 68 or 70 or whatever you push through your air conditioning system. So. At any rate, uh, this trap is about the size of a pail that like a child would use to build a sand castle at the beach. You could hold it pretty easily in your two hands. Uh, those are one inch lines that run in and out of it. The orifice diameter of this one, so when it's stuck open, the narrowest point where steam is flowing through it is about a half inch. Uh, even at very low pressure, 9 PSI, uh, at their cost of steam, it's a $22,000 a year problem. So definitely something you'd want to keep an eye on. Uh, in the worst case scenario, if you checked this with an ultrasound gun and it sounded good, and then as you walked away, it blew and ran for a whole year, that's an expensive problem to have. Last example here, this is a gaudy one. This steam trap's about the size of a backpack. It's a big one. These are two inch lines that are leading to and from it, and the orifice diameter in there is almost an inch. Even at low PSI, you know, nine, nine still, so this is like an HVAC application, not a process application. Uh, this is a really expensive problem, almost $60,000 per year in blowing through. So getting to this sooner than you would with a manual audit, uh, save you a lot of money, save you a lot of, uh, you know, uh, reliability errors in the steam system. Um, so I, I had a customer who had one of these blow and somebody was in the room when it failed and they heard it. It sounded like an explosion to them. If you had ears everywhere on a steam trap this size, you might not need continuous monitoring, but a lot of these are back in you know, locked rooms, machine rooms. We've seen them underground, that sort of thing. So those are all places where having continuous monitoring could save you a lot of money. Uh, some, some steam traps we've seen in high pressure, large applications could cost you know, dozens to hundreds of dollars a day if they're failed. So when you think about this at a plant-wide scale, and this is a manufacturing facility that had about 1,000 steam traps uh, we were our returns here are compared against doing a manual annual inspection. So just the difference between getting these once a year versus getting them much sooner because you have continuous monitoring, uh, there's a tremendous payoff. Uh, not a huge investment and maybe millions of dollars to be saved. Um, so something to think about uh, as you're looking at your facility. Uh, if you have you know more than a thousand traps, these numbers could be bigger. But even if you have a small facility with you know a hundred traps or so, or dozens of traps, you could still see really compelling returns on your investment. And we demonstrate that with the calculator that's in our dashboard. So we can show you how much money you've saved and how much cost you've avoided uh, by implementing our service over the status quo. Our company in the longer term is thinking beyond these assets. Uh, obviously this technology holds a lot of promise, but we're starting and focusing here because we think we have the opportunity to do the most good, uh, both in energy conservation and kind of pushing industry forward. So right now we're working on condition monitoring of assets. As I said, we started with STEAM. That's what we focused on today in this webinar, our first product, but there's lots of applications adjacent to that uh, for something like a thermal powered temperature sensor. Uh, and so. The second product we're bringing to market, that vibration analysis sensor that sits out on motors, is something our customers are really excited about. Most of the places I've seen steam traps, there's a motor nearby, whether it's a condensate pump or a separate system that relies upon motors. So we want to blanket your facility in these, this low power radio network that allows you to use harvested energy sensors. Um, you know, our, our founders talk aspirationally about getting hundreds of data points in a single room, and we think we'll be capable of that uh, but you'd never get there if you had to go change out a battery. At any rate, every time we've uh, developed a new product, and we've had a couple generations of this technology to get where we are today, we've been able to extend the range of the radios and shrink the form factor of the sensor itself. So the difference between that steam trap monitor, our first product, which is about the size of a deck of cards, and the machine health monitor is, is big. The machine health monitor fits in the palm of your hand, the primary control port for it you know, is a little bit bigger than a U.S. quarter. So the size of that uh, continues to shrink. Our form factor shrinks. 
uh, and we can apply more energy efficiency uh, to those sensors with uh, better uh, radio performance. So we're thinking about these small stamp-like sensors. Uh, there's a Wall Street Journal article about us that referred to this type of technology as smart dust. You know, you kind of scatter, scatter this smart dust around your facility, and then it reports back on the, the status of your environment. Thanks again for joining us today. For more information on this or any of our products, please visit www.everactive.com.